Good morning, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Clotilde Tyling from Illumina, and I have the honor of presenting Kim Dale McFarland from University of Wisconsin today. Kim is going to present her research on symbiosis of the tree sloth and its environment. Kim has been working on this for the last three re years in Garrett Swen's lab. Kim, enlighten us. Thank you for the introduction, Clotilde. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, as Clotilde said, I'm going to be talking today about tree sloths. So before we get into the specifics of sloths, let's back up a little bit and talk about just herbivores and how important their gut symbionts are. So the reason that herbivores rely on their gut symbionts, including bacteria, archaea, protozoa, and other organisms, is because they eat plants, and plants uh, components are very complex. We have the overall plant cell wall, which is made up of lignin, hemicellulose, and cellulose, and these components are very difficult to degrade. In fact, most herbivores can't degrade them themselves. So they use their gut symbionts, um, these are just some examples of organisms commonly found in the gut of herbivores, to make volatile fatty acids. And it is actually these which are used for the growth and survival of the host. So lots of herbivores have developed lots of different strategies for how to help their symbionts get the best environment, therefore getting them the best nutrients. We have four gut fermenters, like ruminants, like the cow and sheep, which have an enlarged first stomach that houses the microbial community and allows for fermentation and breakdown of all of their seeds to give them nutrients. And then we have hindgut fermenters. So these have the same sort of compartment, but instead of being one of the first segments, it's one of the last ones. Um, it's down in the lower intestine. But the same sort of idea, where they have a compartment for the microbes to do all the fermentation and get nutrients. And then we kind of have another category. Uh, of herbivores like the pandas and the red pandas that don't have an enlarged stomach but still manage to harness the power of microbes to degrade their feed. Now today we're going to be specifically focusing on four gut fermenters because sloths fall into this category. So more specifically, I said sloths are strict herbivores. Um, they have the slowest digestion rate of any known mammal. So to put this in perspective, it takes about a week for the sloth diet to pass through its digestive tract. And for humans, that's a day or two. And for cows, it's on the order of three or four days. So it's very, very slow. As I said, they're a foregut fermenter. And more specifically, they're a pseudo ruminant. So unlike a cow and a sheep that have an actual fully developed stomach compartment called a rumen for the microbes, the sloths have a somewhat less developed um, stomach that we'll go into in a little bit more detail later. And unfortunately, and the reason we're really interested in these animals is their numbers are declining due to habitat loss, and captive breeding programs have not really been very successful. And in terms of being successful in captive breeding, we also have a really big difference between different types of sloths. In general, we have the two-toed varieties and the three-toed varieties. And these are separated into two different genera, the Colopus and the Bradipus. And they're aptly named because if we zoom in here, we can see that the two-toed has two front claws versus the three-toed has three. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's not their toes. It's actually their front paws. But that's what everyone calls them. So we'll go with it. And in comparing the two groups, they have a slightly different diet. Um, they're both herbivores. And they generally eat tree leaves. But these two-toed animals are able to eat a more wide variety of tree leaves. And they also tend to pick up fruits and nuts in the area versus the three-toed that really sticks to just leaves you know, above 99% of the time. Uh, the two-toed are relatively fast. And I say relatively because, as you know, sloths are very, very slow. So they are faster than the three-toed, but they are both still very slow. And because the two-toed is faster, they also tend to move about more and have a larger home range, thereby facilitating their ability to eat more diverse diet because they have access to more diverse habitats. 
And as I mentioned, there's differences in survival. The two-toed, with its more diverse diet, survives in captivity, and the three-toed, until very recently, has had no success surviving it in captivity. There is one area, um, one zoo, that has had a couple that has survived for a couple years, but that's very, very rare. So when you go to the zoo, you're most likely seeing a two-toed species. Now, these sloths rely on their multi-compartment stomach to degrade their feed like other herbivores. So we have this first stomach, which is a, the pseudo-ruminant part of the stomach. This is the part that's most like a rumen traditionally in cows and sheep, where we believe that most of the microbial breakdown happens. And then the enlarged fecal appendage is, for, is more like um, the atomism and is for other degradation. So when we zoom in, as I mentioned, there is a complex group of organisms, including fungi, which are usually the first to get in there and break down those uh, the lignin outer components and really get into the cellulose that's inside a plant fiber. And then we have the bacteria, which they themselves can break down the plant wall as well to a certain amount. And they take components that the fungi have made as well as their own products. And both of them together are the main organisms to create the volatile fatty acids, which are important for sloth survival and sloth nutrients. Now, there are other organisms in this community, however, that are important to the sloth's health. We have methanogens, which are really important because they siphon carbon away from the system. They pick up things like acetate and formate and release it into the environment as methane. And this methane is carbon that now the sloth can't use as nutrients. And then we also have protozoa, which really affects the bacterial community because uh, they're predating on the bacteria and possibly affecting which bacteria can survive. Now, this whole model is mostly based on ruminant work, like in cows, um, which is another area that I work on. And very little is actually known about the sloth. It's kind of an assumption that this sort of community is happening in the sloth because they're a herbivore and because they can survive on plant matter that they themselves can't break down. And to complicate things just a little bit more, this is not their only symbiosis that's important for their nutrition. The sloths have a complex web whereby they have their gut symbionts that we've already talked about. But in addition to this, the sloth has moths that live and uh, use its fur as a breeding ground. And these moths, when the sloth climbs down the tree, jump off and use the sloth feces as an oviposition site for their eggs to hatch and grow up. And then when the newly hatched moths are mature enough, they fly back up. And often, if the sloth hasn't moved very far, they fly back up to the same sloth. They're again using its fur um, as a mating ground and a place to live. Now, what's interesting about our two species of sloths is that they have slight, or two, sorry, genera of sloths, but they have slight differences in how this symbiosis happens and the specifics of it for each of them. For the three-toed sloth, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention as well, that they also have algae that grows on their fur um, that is possibly a nutrient source for them. So the important differences between the two and three-toed is that the three-toed sloths have more algae growing on them. Um, in the wild, they often have a green tinge to them. They have more moths growing, um, using them as a, I guess, habitat. And very interestingly, the three-toed sloth specifically climbs down the tree to defecate versus the two-toed, which um, tends to just defecate from wherever it is. And this is really important because this facilitates the moth being able to easily get off the sloth into the feces and use it for their um, egg laying. So, in general, what we found is that the symbi these symbioses for three-toed are really obligatory. When they are in captivity, they lose their algae, they lose their mobs, and the three-toed don't survive, versus the two-toed also lose their algae and their mobs, but they are able to survive in captivity. Now, it's pretty dangerous for a sloth to descend the tree to uh, desiccate, and our collaborators uh, that originally got us interested in this project, John Pauly, uh, Dr. John Pauly and Dr. Zach Perry, also at the University of Wisconsin, 
um, hypothesize that the reason they take such a risk to climb down a tree and be on the ground where it's off is very vulnerable. This is when um, the big cats in the area and when other and wild dogs can get them. And they believe that it's because these moths provide nutrients um, in the form of uh, when they uh, lose their wings or when they um, when they themselves defecate on the sloth or when they die, they provide nutrients to this algae. And then this algae could provide a really rich source of lipids for the sloth, which they're not getting in their leaf-based diet. Now my lab, um, Garrett Sewin's lab, which I'm in, took this one step further and we wondered if maybe another reason that they're taking such a risk to keep these moths associated with them um, and the risk of dying every time they go to the bathroom is we were wondering if maybe microbe cycling had something else to do with it. Because it's possible that the gut-associated microbes that are important for sloths to get nutrients from their feed may pass through the digestive tract into the feces, which may then pass into the moths when they hatch and grow up, which then could be brought back to the sloth when, in the course of grooming, the sloth eats the algae, as well as accidentally, or on purpose, we don't know, eats moths that are living on its fur. And then also, there could be some kind of cycling with the moths providing nutrients to the algae, and the algae itself, along with other types of microorganisms, could be some sort of inoculum important for the gut. Now, for the purposes of today, um, in terms of time, I'm um, just going to talk about the possible microbe cycling from the digesta, which is in the first stomach, through the digestive tract and the moth and back. So to look into this, um, we were fortunate enough, working with, like I said, Dr. Polly and Dr. Perry, to have access to wild sloths in Costa Rica. So we collected samples from 10 two-toed and 10 three-toed, um, half male, half female for both of them, um, specifically Bradipus variegatus and Tulopatophini, um, which are both very abundant in this region, um, relatively speaking. And what we did is we collected digestive uh, by gavage, uh, so the insertion of the seeds down the throat and uh, the pulling of digestible contents out with sterile salt water. Um, feces fresh from the rectum, so we didn't let them go to the ground on their own. We took it right out. Um, moths that were currently living on the sloths, and then samples of hair that were particularly algae covered. So what we really wanted to do was investigate the microbial communities present in all of these samples, and we used 16S as well as ITS RNA sequencing with the aluminum I seek. So to get into the nitty gritty of the methods, um, what we did first was we wanted to amplify our gene of interest, which is different depending on what organisms we want. Um, we used previously published primers, uh, so that was nice that they were already optimized. Uh, for bacteria, we focused on um, a very well-known uh, region, the 16S, so often used for classification of bacteria, and focused on the variable 3-4 region. Uh, for archaea, we used the same gene, but a different region more, uh, and the primer is more specific to archaea, so the variable 6 through 8. And then for fungi, um, the interspatial region, uh, or intertranscribed region, first one, also often used for classification. And uh, this PCR was great and easy to do because for each amplicon, we have one primer set. So it was a simple master mix. Um, we used the Kappa High Fidelity Pack. Uh, so this allowed us to process a lot of samples all at once. And we fortunately were able to get our hands on an also 96 well column cleanup for this because this is just step one. We're going to do another PCR, and so we have to clean up our product. Um, and we chose to use, there's many options on the market, but we chose to use in vitro just pure link. Um, and the 96 well format is really great because it's high throughput. You do your PCR in a 96 well plate and then immediately clean it up in a 96 well plate. And it also prevents cross-contamination because these samples all have exactly the same barcode, or sorry, they don't have a barcode, which is for Illumina. So we can't tell them apart if we accidentally mix them together. So it was really nice to know that cross-contamination pretty much can't happen if you stick with uh, these formats. So then we moved on to, um, we have our piece of a gene of interest that we could use to classify 
our organisms. And so what we need to do is attach unique indices so when we sequence them, we can tell them apart, and then the Illumina adapters so that they can work on the MySeq platform. Um, through, again, previously published indices, uh, there's even more out there now. Uh, because you have an indice on both reads, so this is a unique sequence for each sample, uh, you have it on both ends. So together, you can get 384, so that's four 96 well plates. Uh, there's even more out there now. Um, you could probably run 1,000 if you were really crazy. Um, we also great found a 96 well gel cleanup. Again, others on the market, but we use the Zymo Clean, um, continuing to be high throughput, and then elution into our 96 well plate made it really easy to quantify, which we did uh, with the qubit assay. Again, 96 well plate. So that you know. One really great thing about this protocol is that you start in a 96 well and you can just take it all the way through. So then once we had all of our cleaned up pieces of DNA, which are gene of interest, plus the unique barcode, plus Illumina adapters, we can sequence them. Um, and like I said, we use the MySeq platform. And this is really great because they all had the same adapters and the same sequencing primers. We can run any mixture of archaea, bacteria, and fungi together on a single run. So you could run all amplicons for all samples all at once. Or if one sample failed from a past run, we could just put it on the next run no matter the amplicon type. Um, the, the more specifics, it's a paired end, and we use the 2 by 300 V3 kit. Uh, we've gone down to 5% Biax control. Um, there are, there's literature out there now with Illumina that we can go even lower, which we intend to. We just haven't done it yet. And we've loaded anywhere from 10 to 14 picomolar of DNA on the actual machine. And this has yielded um, lots of sequences, uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 million pass filter, mostly depending on how much we loaded. And then final pieces of DNA that we get through our cleanup, anywhere from 10 to 15 million. So if you divide this by your 384 samples, you have a lot of coverage, which is great. So once we ran the sequencer, um, we generally do most of our analysis and cleanup in mother for cleanup of sequences and initial analysis, and then R, the vegan package for uh, statistical um, analyses of the cleaned up data. So just very briefly, uh, we use Mother to make the contig. So we have read one in one direction and read two in another. And making contig just means to overlap those so they're one clean sequence. And then we removed poor quality ones for the lots of quality metrics that we go through. We align to Silva to make sure that it's the gene we think it is in the region we think it is. And then we classify um, with green genes. Now, the species concept, um, for those who don't know, the species concept in bacteria and archaea and fungi is very wishy-washy. Um, so we use what are called operational taxonomic units, or OTUs, um, which are our equivalent of species. So you can classify sequences based on how similar they are, like sh sharing 80% of base pairs, sharing 90. Um, and when you get down to sharing most, so 97 plus, we call that the same OTU or species. Um, there's lots of argument out there, and I would love to take questions about what the cutoff should actually be. Um, but we use 97, and it's a, it's a pretty standard uh, cutoff. And then for the R vegan package, in case of this talk, really just used it for permutational ANOVA, so looking at does this community differ by diet, by host, by any of those factors normally in ANOVA. And then just other options. There's lots of other options, but not particularly relevant for this talk. So after all those methods, let's refocus and bring back to what we care about using these methods for. So what we want to know is what are the bacteria associated with two and three toast sloths, and um, what could these possibly be contributing to cycling through um, the GI tract, the moths, and back up to the sloth. Um, we started out very focused on the sloth as the mammal and what is important to its survival on its leaf-based diet. So to start, just a little, a big, or the big picture of what we found. Um, we have 
the relative abundance of sequences classified at the phyla level in our different sample types. And we have two toed, three toed here, uh, shortened for the graftophytes. And what we see is pretty common gut communities in terms of having a large abundance of vermicutes and bacteroidetes um, to more than half of the community. And also proteobacteria, which are less common um, in, gut, in uh, the guts of herbivores, but not entirely unheard of. Now, when we go through the GI tract, we find a different community in the feces, which we expected because the digesters from the fore stomach where a microbial breakdown of leaves and seed are happening. And feces, by the time the plant biomass gets down that far of the GI tract, you know, this is a week later in its loss, it's mostly broken down. The components are very similar regardless of what the seed was. So we see a different community um, and actually this abundance of proteobacteria spiked up. Now in the moths, uh, we didn't know what to expect at all. And so it was very interesting to find that we had some similar groups in terms of we had bacteria, uh, bacteroidetes in very small abundance. And we had the firmogutes and the proteobacteria. Um, but we didn't really know what they were doing since we didn't know how they could eat the feces, which looks like this, and then end up with a community like this. So we wanted to delve deeper into what these communities could be doing and if any of these shared bars contained the same organism. So when we looked at diversity and richness, so we have Shannon's diversity, which takes into account um, how many species are there, or OTUs, and how abundant they are, and how evenly they're, they're distributed. So is everybody three, or is somebody 100 and somebody three? Um, versus Chow, which is richness, which is just how many different OTUs were there. And what we see in the digesta of, again, two-toed and three-toed sloths is that the two-toed has a much more rich community and a more diverse uh, community as well, which we would expect because they're eating a more diverse diet. They need different gut microbes to degrade their different feed stuff versus the three-toed who, if they're eating only the same thing over and over, they only need a couple of organisms to take care of those components. Um, statistically, though, the only difference that was found was in richness um, was significantly different between the two. Now, in the feces, we see um, some interesting patterns. So for two-toed, we see a decrease in um, diversity versus three-toed, we see an increase. Uh, neither is significant, though, so uh, maybe larger sample numbers could help ascertain what's going on there. Um, and then we see pretty similar richness levels. And then in the moth, um, not surprisingly, considering the bar chart had significantly fewer colors in it, we see a drop in both um, the diversity and the richness. Um, and then because we're talking about microcycling, an interesting trend we found, um, again, the only trend that was significant, but in three-toed, the moving from the foregut digesta to the feces to the moth was significantly different in terms of their diversity, but not their richness. So a lot of this depends on what metric you use. Um, these are our personal favorites, but uh, of course we'll investigate others to see if the trend holds. Now to put this all in context, these are just numbers, right? Well, the cow is a really no well-known a herbivore that is very efficient at degrading its feed. And what we see in our research is that, in general, cow rumen, which is comparable to the digesta, is much more diverse and much, much, much more rich. And the feces as well is also more diverse and rich than what we find in sloths. So overall, two and three toed sloths compared to another herbivore are very low diversity, um, which could have to do with the fact that they're eating a lot of leaves. And leaves are particularly hard for microbes to degrade. So there's probably only a very small subset of microorganisms that are able to survive on what the sloth is eating. Now, another way to compare these communities um, in terms of the two versus the three toed is to use um, non-multidimensional scaling. Um, so what these are is plots that each dot 
for each shape represents the total microbial community of one individual animal. So the closer two dots are together, like these two, are very similar in terms of overall community, versus these two are very different because they're very far apart. And what we see is that, in general, our two and three-toed sloths are different in their forega community. Again, not super surprising because they're eating different things. However, this doesn't persist through the rest of our samples. We see in the feces and the moths that there's considerable overlap of the two groups showing that they have similar communities. And this is shown again if we do permutation LANOVA comparing to um, the two groups that only the digester are significantly different. Again, not super surprising since different diets are often shown to affect foregut and uh, hindgut communities depending on which sort of fermenter you are. So getting more specific, um, so this is just you know a single point showing you the overall community and we're really interested in specific microbes of what they're doing, uh, what they're possibly doing, and if they're being cycled. So we're able to show their abundance, um, so 0 to 100% abundance. Um, obviously, no one's going to be all the way up here because there's more than one microbe in every single gut. And we really wanted to delve into the digestive since it was different between the two and three toast cloths and try to investigate what's happening there. So remember, again, OTUs are like species, and they're just numbered based on um, where they were in the data set. The number is not important. Um, but what is important is what sort of organisms we're seeing. Um, first up, we have a group of, these are all Bacteroidetes, which uh, group into a bunch of Prevotella species, which are very common rumens and biomes, and then some unclassified Bacteroidiales, which um, it's very difficult to say what they're doing since they're not classified very well. But we can see here that both two and three-toed sloths have Prevotella. They just have different ones. The two-toed tend to have this one and very small abundances of this one versus the three toes tend to have this three in the middle. Um, this is uh, definitely an avenue for further research that it would be great to get isolates or to get full length sequences of these sorts of uh, species to really be able to say what they could possibly be doing and why this Prevotella is found in two toes but not in three toes. Um, we also have one uh, important the OTU1, the first one out of the data set, uh, Firmicutes, uh, but unfortunately, again, unclassified Crustaleus, so it's really hard to say what it's doing, but it seems to be important in two-toed, and it wasn't found at all in the three-toed digesta. So these uh, sort of differences are what were contributing to the differences we saw in the plot four, where the dots were very different. Well, this is one of the OTUs that's causing them to be very different. Moving down, we have the proteobacteria that were important to differences. Um, interestingly, uh, the Cetobacter um, is an aerobic organism, so we're very unclear what that one could be doing, but it seems to be passing um, in some three toed but not in two toed um, And we see here that this is a particularly important group for variation within our species, so two toed this Prevotella is kind of in all of them, but when we look at two-toed in terms of their proteobacteria, what's really important is that one sloth had a lot of this acetobacillus, and here one sloth had a lot of this unclassified entero. So um, we think that there's probably differences, again, diet. These are individual animals, not on a controlled diet in the wild, and it could be that this OTU bloomed in abundance because the sloth ate something that that OTU, that organism, was really good at degrading. And a cool group that we weren't expecting to find are the spirochetes, where we found some treponema in the two-toed, but not the three-toed sloth. Now, spirochetes are often found in herbivores, um, and they're often associated with other organisms found in herbivores, but very little is known about what they're doing, because they are not generally known for degrading cellulose or lignin or any of those plant components. So they could be important to, excuse me, that web of symbiosis we were seeing earlier where the fungi are giving nutrients to the bacteria and then the bacteria are being eaten by the protozoa and the bacteria are interacting with themselves. 
So we really think that could be an indicator of the more complex and more diverse uh, communities we're seeing in the Juto because there's possibly an interaction there. But again, all hypotheses here. It's a lot of hypothesis making when you have this much sequencing data. So just to wrap up the first part um, of comparing the two and three toed sloths in general, um, we have sloths and their associated moths have very low diversity gut communities. Remember that cows, um, in terms of you know, riches and diversity, were much higher um, and they're very common herbivore. Uh, two and three toed sloths possess the different digestive communities in their uh, foregut stomach, um, characterized by different Pravitella species, but both having Pravitella. The spirochete, trypanema, and then some clusteriales in the two-toed, and then this uh, a possibly aerobic Cetobacter in the three-toed with an unknown function. Um, but despite differences seen in this first uh, digestive community, we don't see differences in their feces or in the moths that are then eating um, the feces when they're uh, larva and when they're young. So this really pushed forward our interest in the microbe cycling question, because if two and three toed sloths have different orga communities, but very similar feces and moth communities, how are they getting that different orga community? Is the moth carrying with it something very specific to the three toes, or is it some other factor that we haven't seen in this particular cycle that is causing them to have different microbes? So the first question we had is just, we saw different communities, but within each animal was the whole microbiota being cyclic, and we just couldn't see it in the other set of plots. So this is the same sort of um, scaling plot where each dot each shape is an individual organism, only now we're seeing, based on color, the digestive species and moths of all animals together. Um, so we still see that difference of our digestive communities is still different, um, just on a slightly larger plot. But what we see is that digesta is different than feces, feces is different than moths. Um, and with permutational ANOVA, um, this is also significant. So it doesn't look like, and this is not surprising considering the other data I've shown, that it's not the whole microbiota that's just going from the foregut to the distal gut to the maw, and then back into the foregut. So that doesn't mean that there's still not some sort of microbe cycling happening. So when we delve specifically into in each individual animal, we have how many OTUs were found in the digesta in this pink color, how many were found in the feces, in the yellow, and how many were found in the moths from that sloth. So these are the moths that were living on the sloth when it was captured um, in the blue. And then what ones are shared are shown in the intersections of the rainbow colors. Um, and then we did this for every single individual animal. And what we saw is that the middle part were microbes that were found in all three sections. So microbes that were possibly being cycled was very small number. So we have to only two in this first example of the two toes. We have up to 11 here, but in the other ones, we're having two, one, two. And then in the three-toed animals, which we think microcycling might be even more important because they rely on their symbionts and can't survive without them in captivity, we see even less possible cycling. We don't see any shared here or here or here, um, and one. So. It's kind of, honestly, a little bit of a letdown, but we still delved deeper that, you know, if this one of these OTUs is required by the sloth, it's super, super important for the sloth, then it's still important that it's being taken into the gut and moved all the way through into the moth and then coming, possibly coming back. Um, even if only a couple of organisms are doing it, it could be very, very important for the sloth. So we wanted to look at the abundance of these shared OTUs to look at, is this something that was very highly abundant in the sloth, and then not so much in the moth, or vice versa. So again, we're going to do um, so a heat map that shows the relative abundance in terms of how much of the community is made of of this specific species. And in each sloth, um, these are the OTUs that were possibly shared among all three samples of an individual sloth. So for example, this sloth has two OTUs. Um, four 
and very light color, but two that were found, um, at least one sequence was found of this species in all three sample types. And what we see here is I've ordered it just to how we believe the cycling would be happening of the digesta to the feces to the moth. And then you'd loop back around to the digesta. So what we see is some interesting patterns. First of all, if we look at just these numbers, it's that intersection of how many OTUs were shared uh, between all three sample types in this specific swath. So this is our one that's 11, which is all of these, um, versus um, there's zero in here. They're just shown because somebody else had them shared. And the interesting trends we found were um, this OTU, which was that acetobacter that we mentioned, or that I mentioned before. Um, it's an aerobic organism that was important in three toad, but what was really interesting to us is that we found a trend in two of the two toad where it was highly abundant in the foregut and then lesser in the feces and lesser again in the moss, but then again higher in the feces. So this is a possible micro that is being cycled with our original hypothesis as something that's important to digestion and digestion in the two toad but that is able to pass through this cycle to then come back into the gut. Um, but it's a, generally, this organism is considered strictly aerobic, which the gut is not. So um, we're really looking into trying to find out more about this organism and possibly finding if this classification is wrong, or maybe if it's the one acetobacter so far that's not aerobic. We're really trying to see how it could be important for you know these two toad sloths since it was found in two of them in a similar pattern. Now, as the title of my sloth kind of gave away, we were really, really focused on the moths. Um, they were the sexy animal. And we kind of forgot about the moths until we saw this data because we had an OTU that in two of the two toads wasn't very abundant in the gut, proliferated some in the feces, and then was super highly abundant in the moth. And this organism um, was that unclassified entero um, that had come up before in the two versus three. And so this switched our thinking a little bit in that, well, there might be, in the case of the Zetobacter, some, some organisms that are important to the sloth that are being cycled through. But this is strong evidence that there are microbes being cycled through the sloth that are actually important to the moth. Um, that, has, that grows up and as larvae eats the feces of the sloth, so that's its initial gut inoculum. So that switched our focus a little bit to the moth, and this is very cool because this family is often insect associated, and it has members that can reduce nitrate uh, to nitrite, which could be really important to that cycling, or sorry, to that symbiosis with the algae. If this is the organism in the moth, that helps create nitrite, then that's important nitrogen source when the moth flies up and lives on the sloth for those algae, because nitrogen is very limiting um, in this environment. So that was cool, and that really pushed us to, um, in the future, look more into the moths and get more moths. Um, they're very tiny, so we need a lot of them uh, to look at their DNA and just push forward with maybe the moth is really what we should be focusing on. So kind of to summarize microbe cycling, we initially thought there was going to be a bunch of microbes important to digestion in the sloth that passed through the gut, and then the moth was used as a vehicle to bring it back to the gut. And what we really found is there are microbes that pass from the, through the gut of the sloth, and there are ones that pass from the feces to the moth, and then the moth to the digestive. But in general, they're different. Um, so perhaps the microbe cycling from digestive down is not what's important. And what we really want to do more work on now is focusing on the moth that we have organisms that maybe it's that the moth is driving the symbiosis, not the sloth. But the moth really needs these microbes. And so it's co-evolved to be able to get its microbes through the feces and have them survive the digestive so it can get them back into its next, gen next generation of eggs that hatch in the feces. Now today, I've only talked about this part of, of the web, and we're still doing work looking at those hair samples that perhaps 
may add another layer of complexity that maybe this cycle isn't happening, but maybe this larger cycle is what is happening, which is why we don't see um, the connection here, because it has to pass through the hair. And I um, alluded to or mentioned that diet seemed to be really important because these two spots eat something different. And we realized after the fact, and now we're going to go back and do more work, that we should be looking at the microbes on the diet and in their environment to see if maybe cycling is being washed out by the fact that they're getting a lot of microbes from their environment. And of course, this has only been bacteria so far, and we're continuing um, analysis of fungi and archaea that uh, could also be a driving force of cycling here that we just haven't gotten through all of that data yet and uh, didn't have time to present today. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Garrett Stewin, my PI, and all of our lab members, uh, particularly Andrew Steinberger, who has an undergrad who's taken up the reins of this last project recently and is really helping push through the final samples. Uh, Cecil and Illumina for inviting me to do this talk, of course. And then our collaborators, uh, Dr. Polly and Dr. Perry, and those that work in Costa Rica for actually collecting the samples for us um, since blogs are few and far between here in Wisconsin. And then finally, um, we were able to have hands-on experience and actually run our own MySeq from start to finish um, through the AVRL here on our campus um, through Dave O'Connor's group um, with particular help from George Dennis getting it up and running and learning how to use the machine. So with that, I thank you all for listening, and we'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Kim. So there is a question uh, online, and I have quite a few, but let's start with the one from, um, from Jonas, which is, how are you dealing with the PCR primer bias um, concerning the influence on sequences number output per OTUs? This is a crucial question for all the approaches of quantification in next generation sequencing. That's so yeah, so this, yeah, this is a really good point, um, and it's something that in the field of uh, sequencing, where you know where the sequencing field is at now, it's something we have to accept. That you know, I use the, the bacteria, I use the 16S B3 V4, and other people have been using the 16S just V4. So if I find 100 sequences from Acetobacter and somebody else with a different amplicon finds 50 sequences, no, we can't really say that my community has more than their community. Uh, so that's why when uh, within a study like this, where all of the same amplicon was used for bacteria, within the study, um, we use relative abundance. Um, and we really use that vegan package, because it has a lot of statistical power since you can do permutations, uh, to really say whether 100 sequences in this sample, is that really different than 50 sequences here, because it's relatively speaking. Um, so that's why we do really strong statistical cutoffs of we don't want to, yeah, we don't want to say something's different just because the PCR bias happened. Um, so it's a, it's a known problem that we try to get around with just being really careful with our statistics, basically. OK, there's another one saying, um, how does the method distinguish between metabolically active bacteria and dead bacteria nutrients? Another good question. It doesn't. Another big pitfall of sequencing um, is that you are picking up, um, and this is a big concern in feces, since uh, what is passing dead from the foregut is passing through the feces on the way out. Um, yeah, it's just something you, you can't tell with this method, um, which is, again, why we're really careful with we don't want to be talking about organisms that only a couple sequences occur, which would happen more with, with dead bacteria since they're being broken down as they pass through the gut and into the moths, possibly. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And then if you have consistency within your study, then at that point, I, I, it, it doesn't matter if you're always wrong, then you have an answer. Do you know what I mean? Versus not having the consistency on how you do your study. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I have, um, I have a few questions. I'm, I was wondering, so I don't know much about the, the sloth, and I was wondering if there was an evolution between the three-toed sloth 
and the two-toed sloth, and maybe one has a longer life than the other, or anything like this, and that might change the community? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting point that um, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but the two sloth genera, the two and three toed, they diverged many millions of years ago um, in terms of phylogeny. So despite the fact that they you know, live in the same area and eat the same things and look really similar to our naked eye, they actually phylogenetically are very different from each other, which could contribute to why we're seeing differences, that they've been evolving separately for millions of years. Okay. Okay, so that was one of the questions. And do you think also that maybe the community, whether it's in the stool, whether it's in, in their gut, um, would change through time? So in a baby sloth, it could have very different um, uh, a community versus an adult, and then throughout the ages of that sloth also. Yeah, it definitely could. Um, age and development have been huge influences in um, more studied animals like um, sheep and cows. And uh, these animals were all, the ones in the study were all fully adult. At least um, they do that by how much they weigh because they were born wild, so we don't know their exact age, but they're all full grown. Um, and we would, <laughs> uh, we would love to get our hands on, on baby sloth samples, I have to say. I would love to be the one doing that sampling. Um, <laughs> but it's not something we've, we've been able to do yet, but definitely we would expect differences in that, especially in still nursing um, baby sloths. Oh, yeah, that would be interesting, definitely. Another question for you is, um, do you think that maybe you'll, you'll compare, I know we don't eat moths, but, but it would be interesting to compare what the sloth is doing versus a, a, a vegetarian, a, a somebody who's vegan or something like this, and looking at the digestive system versus the stool and having the difference between the human and the, and, uh, and the sloth and maybe the cow too, right? Having those differences. Yeah, the definitely, community. because their, their diet is um, incredibly low protein. Um, so that's re a really big question of how can they possibly survive when leaves have basically no protein in them and they're not, you know, they're eating the occasional moth here and there, but is that really enough protein versus a, a human um, vegetarian and vegan? They have to be pretty careful to get enough protein in their diet. Mm. Okay, and then looking at how you had the moth at the, afterwards um, uh, separated in a way because of, of its bacteria community, um, do you think maybe that moth is a parasite? Instead of helping, maybe it is a parasite of, of the sloth? It is possible. Um, yeah, it's definitely a possibility, and that just opens up, you know, an even bigger question of, you know, well, then why? Why is the three toad climbing down the tree? There's no, like, there's nothing we can figure out so far that's positive for the three-toed doing this, um, except that it allows the moth to more easily get access to the feces, because um, instead of having to fly all the way down, they can literally just hop off onto the ground and the feces are right there. So, yeah, and there, there could be something important to the sloths that we're just not seeing, and then the moths are just taking advantage of it. It's very possible. Hmm. Another uh, question for, for my, our audience is um, how high was the fungal diversity and which group uh, dominated? Um, so that's very preliminary data, um, but I can say that the fungal diversity was incredibly low in the digesta. Uh, we were getting anywhere from two to four OTUs, um, oh. and unfortunately they were unclassified Neocalomastomycota, so um, that's a silo level, so that's not, you know, that's super not helpful. They're all very unclassified, um, and we're working on developing primers um, to do some Sanger sequencing since it is so low diversity to try to get full length for those so we can actually talk about what, what they are or classify them better. Because, um, yeah, the fungal, very low diversity and mostly unclassified. Mm, interesting. Okay, there's another question saying, how many uh, PCR cycles did you use? And for um, how so many? Yeah, for how many yeah. uh, for how many seconds? So it's actually a very uh, specific question to your method. Yeah. So um, 
I'd have to get back to you, Megan, about how many seconds was the, the program, but I do know that for archaea and bacteria, we did 25 cycles on the first PCR and then um, just five on the second one to add the adapters. Uh, versus fungi, um, we believe because the fungi is more is less abundant, which we could verify by quantitative PCR. But uh, we believe it's less abundant because we had to go up to 30 cycles for the fungi in the first PCR to to even see a product. Hmm. Okay. And then another question is, how did you normalize your sequencing to compare all your samples? Um, That's a good one. So I guess I'll, I, at which stage? So normalizing it, putting it on the machine, we quantified it, and then we added the same nanomoles of DNA from each sample before we ran it, and, the, you know, and that tends to give us pretty even coverage across all samples. But then in terms of analysis, um, what we do is we subsample the sequences. Um, so all the bacterial sequences, we subsample down to the smallest number. Um, in a given sample, so if the lowest sample had only a thousand sequences, we subsample down to a thousand for everybody, and we do that independently. Um, I think I did 15 times for this, and then we average those subsamples, and that's how we can deal with the fact that one sample had 5,000 sequences and one had 2,000, say. Okay, interesting. I thought that mother also has something that can normalize, right? Doesn't it have at the beginning of its yes. timeline? Okay. Yeah, the newest the newest version has a command called normalize.shared, which will take will calculate the relative abundance and then yeah. convert that back to raw OTU counts. Um, the analysis in this presentation was done before the newest mother came out, so I, I didn't have the luxury of that command yet. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Kim. Um, I think we're we we answered most of the questions, uh, and if any other one comes up, uh, you'll be able to email them back. So thank you so much. Everybody has a great day or a great evening, and that's it.